John. Um, so thank you, first of all, for the, the invitation to come and, and talk tonight. It's always really good to, um, to be able to talk about the work of the university. Um, Solent University has a particular department with its engineering department that is uh, a yacht design department. We're actually the only university in the world that provides undergraduate degrees specifically in yacht design. So high performance hydrofoils and, and small sailing craft are uh, really our, our particular specialist area. So what I'd like to talk about tonight is just a, a little bit of the, the brief history of hydrofoils, um, what the purpose of them is and how they, they actually work, um, to delve a little bit deeper into the science of foil theory and how aerofoils or hydrofoils work, and then just to talk about the, the control systems and how we go about testing hydrofoils. Uh, on the, uh, the screen here, the picture you can see is a hydrofoil called the Solent Whisper, which we designed and built at the university in 2015. One of my colleagues, Ron Price, who was a senior lecturer at the time, I did an awful lot of work designing it and then did all the brave stuff testing it. Um, so we've, we've got some experience of, of building and running hydrofoils as well as the, the theory behind them. So first of all, let's, let's have a look at a, a brief history of hydrofoils and where they came from. So it actually started off um, with a, a fairly local connection. John Thornycroft of, of Vosper Thornycroft fame, although he was working on the Thames at the time. Um, and the, the Thornycroft family looked at the full scale trials of a vessel with a bow foil and a flat stern, sort of half hydroplane, half hydrofoil. Um, they didn't invent hydrofoils, and he didn't, didn't claim to invent it, but he was one of the first people really to sort of to look at the development and to start to, to recall the development. Um, if we fast forward a bit to 1905, we have William Meacham, who did a number of experiments based around hydrofoils, and really perhaps we thought he was the first person to put forward a scientific analysis and a publication of, of ideas. Uh, his work was then followed by an Italian gentleman, Enrico Follanini, in 1911 on the Italian lakes, who took it a step further, um, built and tested a range of high-speed hydrofoils. Um, to a certain extent, the, the mindset behind hydrofoils in the first place and behind this work was seaplanes and the development of aviation and trying to find a way to make a seaplane take off more efficiently. Um, so we ended up with sort of flying boats, perhaps a little bit by, by accident. Uh, anyway, um, Follanini managed with a 60 horsepower engine in 1911 to reach a speed of 42.5 miles an hour, which I'm sure we'd, we'd all agree that actually was quite remarkable for the time, particularly on, on water. Um, bearing in mind at the time the, the land speed record was only in the region of about 126 miles an hour. Now, the work of Meacham and the work of Fornanini was watched quite carefully by none other than Alexander Graham Bell, who I suspect was bored of telephones by this point and wanted to do something a bit more interesting. Um, and he toured uh, Europe in 1911 uh, and actually met Enrico Forlanini and went out on his hydrofoil and uh, um, learned from him and, and really started to get interested in the idea of hydrofoils and the development of hydrofoils. So much so that uh, with a slight interruption during the war, Alexander Graham Bell post-war in 1919 set what was at the time the world water speed record of 71 miles an hour using 700 horsepower of installed power. Uh, he was actually effectively lent to 350 horsepower engines by the American military uh, to, to build his vessel, which he ran in the Canadian lakes. Um, so uh, really the sort of the first, first example of a, a good high-speed hydrofoil. And then nothing really happened too much with hydrofoils. There was a bit of development, and, and particularly in, maybe in, in Eastern Europe on wide waterways, uh, where they're a little bit more suited. And then in 1953, a couple, Frank and Stella Hellingley, um, Frank Hellingley claimed to be a, a direct descendant of Nelson, decided that they were interested in high speed uh, uh, travel on water, particularly perhaps the, the military applications, and they designed and built a vessel called the White Hawk Hydrofoil, uh, actually with, with some help from some young structural engineers who would go on to work with Donald Campbell on the, the Bluebird design. Um, Frank and Stella Hellingley were obviously quite good at persuading people to do things because they persuaded the government to lend them a Rolls-Royce Derwent Mark V jet engine to power their, their hydrofoil, uh, which, as it says here, produced 17.8 kilonewtons of thrust. Now, if we just go back to Alexander Graham Bell, we've got 71 miles per hour with 700 horsepower of piston engine. And now we've got 17.8 kilonewtons of Rolls-Royce thrust. Anybody on the chat panel want to have a guess as to how fast the White Hawk hydrofoil went? Any guesses? Oh, well, 
Alexander Graham Bell managed 71 miles an hour with his 700 horsepower engine. And Frank and Stanley Lee, um, Ken Service says 85, fairly good guess. They managed 70.86 miles per hour. So actually, despite the might of, of the Rolls Royce engine behind them, they uh, they didn't quite uh, didn't quite reach Alexander Graham Bell's record. Um, and there's actually there's there's some interesting anecdotal evidence about this. Um, they said that as the vessel accelerated and as it went faster and faster, it would rise with its nose up and it would start to to lift up out the water and would start to run very quickly. And then at a certain speed, it would nose dive and actually cause quite a lot of, of damage. Um, so on a number of occasions, they rebuilt the vessel. Um, they did feel at one point, and they claimed that it was testing and running at over 100 miles an hour. Unfortunately, it didn't have a speedo fitted, which made that look a bit difficult to, to verify. Uh, but they certainly were, were going, going spectacularly fast. Um, in an effort to go a little bit faster, Frank Henningley, as a, a, somebody who understood physics and understood engineering, realised that perhaps he needed to make the vessel a little bit lighter. There wasn't really anything he could take out of the structure to make it lighter. Couldn't carry any less fuel pretty much stuck with the engine that he'd been lent. But he did realise that his wife was smaller and lighter than him, so he put her in, got her to drive instead. Um, but still didn't reach the, the particular, um, particular speed that uh, Alexander Graham Bell set. Um, this vessel was actually, again, a local connection. It was shipped off to America for a series of demonstration tests for the US Navy, um, who didn't pick up on it in the end and didn't, didn't pursue it. So, and it was then shipped back to the UK uh, but all the records of it appear to have been lost when it arrived in Southampton. Uh, the Inland Revenue were interested in it because they thought it was something new coming in the country and they wanted to tax it. Uh, and all the, the, the records for it disappear. So um, although Southampton docks have been redeveloped a lot since the 50s, it'd be nice to think that maybe somewhere in the corner of a warehouse there's a large tarp holding with this under it. Anyway, so the lots and lots of power, but rather disappointing in terms of speed. Actually, from the 1950s onwards, there was a lot of development of hydrofoils. The Soviet Union was interested in the development. Uh, governments in Eastern Europe, where waterways are typically wider and more suited to high-speed travel, were building craft. And even in the Solent in the UK, we saw that Red Funnel were running the shearwater hydrofoils. Uh, but if we look at a, a range, typical range of these hydrofoils, and we look at the power and the speed that they achieved, we can see from the graph here that there's really a, effectively a barrel up at about 70 miles an hour. Um, on the right hand side of the graph where you've got, uh, got lots of horsepower per tonne with a very powerful vessel, down to the left hand side where only one horsepower per tonne, a very light vessel, we can see really there's, there's not a huge correlation between the power and the performance. Um, so hydrofoils really have a, have a limitation that we can see from this and we'll, we'll come back to this later on. So from a commercial point of view, we've sort of clearly seen that actually hydrofoils haven't really taken off if, if you'll excuse the pun. But in the sailing world, they started to. Now, there's a particular class of dinghy called the, the International Moth. And in 1974, uh, a sailor from the Moth decided that he was going to try and build some hydrofoils on it to get it to, to sail. Now, the Moth is, is what's referred to as a development class. You can race your Moth against other people. You can do whatever you want to make it go faster. Um, and it's generally in, in the sailing world considered the, fast way to, or the fastest way to get a trip to casualty. Um, they are pretty lethal. Um, incredibly exciting, um, but to be honest, um, really um, very much for, for people who enjoy extreme sports. So the first, first flight of the Moth was in, in 1974. Really, we saw from, from about 1994 onwards some really serious development, and that starts to coincide perhaps with greater availability of light but very stiff and strong materials like carbon fibre um, and coming into a sensible price bracket where hobbyists can, can come up with new and exciting ways to injure themselves. Uh, the moths carried on, and, and, and still today, the moth is a very exciting class of, of sailing. Uh, but the America's Cup started to get interested in, in, um, in hydrofoils. Uh, this started in 2013. Now, uh, for the 2013 America's Cup, the yachts were launched in 2012. Um, there is a huge amount of spying that goes on in the America's Cup on different teams. There's, there's more spying in the America's Cup than there was in the Cold War, really. Uh, so in Auckland Harbour, Team New Zealand bring out their brand new catamaran that we can see here on the day of launching and they sail it out into the Gulf and it goes really slowly. And all the spies from all the other teams think, finally, the Kiwis have got it wrong. Fantastic. Uh, we're going we're gonna to get them. Three days after launching, they go out in a slightly better breeze. And this time they've got the hydrofoils fitted. And just literally three days after launch, this vessel lifts up and disappears off over the horizon. 
Now, you can imagine all the other the, the American Cup teams and the spies watching this are rather downhearted that the Kiwis once again uh, would appear to be, be very well in the lead. Uh, what they managed to do was to exploit a particular rule within the America's Cup. They said you're allowed something called dagger boards. Now dagger boards we can see in the middle of the vessel here are the vertical boards that stop the vessel sliding sideways through the water effectively and they realised that there was nothing in the rules to say you couldn't bend the end of them around a little bit to create a hydrofoil. So they did just that and, and off they went. Um, incredible performance, absolutely amazing technology, very clever design and um, all credit to them for doing it. Um, there's a photo there of the, the America's Cup itself, it's the, the oldest cup in, in, one of the oldest cups in sport. Um, I was very fortunate last year to have to go to a meeting where the America's Cup was on display. I can tell you that was the, probably the closest Britain has got in the last few years to regaining the America's Cup. It was only one large security guard, in fact that I can't run very fast, but, but left it in place. So moving on, the, the 2015 America's Cup, the series after, um, the organisers decide that hydrofoils are far more interesting than, than non-hydrofoils. So they introduce a whole new class and a whole new set of rules called the AC45. And we see some amazing sailing, um, some fantastic action, um, um, real sort of Formula One level. As the technology matures a little bit, we start to see uh, more and more similar vessels. And we've got an example here of a particular class called the Sail GP. Uh, or the, the F50 class rather than runs in a set of races called the Sail GP. Uh, these machines are incredibly fast. They will uh, all, well, COVID allowing, be racing in Plymouth next year. Uh, the speed record for one of these is just over 51 knots. That's quite amazing for, for effectively for a whole lot of renewable energy. And then we've seen following Sail GP and following the, the more recent America's Cup, a change in direction of hydrofoils for the America's Cup. These vessels were getting very large, very powerful, very fast and very dangerous. And it was decided by the couple organisers who get to write the rules, that they were going to introduce a whole new set of rules for the next America's Cup. And what they introduced was a mono hull set of rules. And what I've got here, I know sometimes it doesn't always work particularly well over Zoom, but this is just a video of their prototype being tested uh, just off Auckland. Gives us a bit of a feel, a bit of an idea of how fast these hydrofoils go. This is a, a fish eye view from a very scared fish. Um, there we have it, instant sushi. So amazing technology, amazing speeds. These new hydrofoils, this new America's Cup class is effectively designed to be balanced fore and aft and balanced transversely with weights and forces so that they can sail with the minimum amount of the hydrofoil underwater but still getting the performance they need. And we'll see those racing hopefully fairly soon and um, um, really should give us, give us some very exciting racing. So that's a very quick sort of run through the development of, of hydrofoils up to, to modern day and what we'll be seeing in the next next year or so. Um, so the question really is why why use hydrofoils? What's the point of them? What do they do from, from a physics point of view to be able to improve performance? If we look at it as a, a very basic system, our yacht has got a set of sails. Those sails provide a driving force through creating aerodynamic lift and aerodynamic forces which drive our vessel forward. And as we drive our vessel forward and push it in the water, the water pushes back and creates a resistance force. Now, the bigger the driving force, the more drive we've got to push us forward, and in theory, the faster we'll be able to go. But as we go faster and faster, we create more and more of the resistance force. And for us, practically, there's a limit to how much driving force we can create. There's a limit to the size of the rig that we can put on the vessel safely. Um, there's a limit to the energy in the air that's, that's available. So if we want to go really, really fast, our only option is to start to reduce the resistance force and to get that down to a minimum. So the point of hydrofoils really is to do this, it's to reduce the resistance to the absolute minimum. And if we look at the resistance for a typical vessel, it's made up of three discrete components. We've got the aerodynamic resistance or the air resistance as the vessel moves through the water. We've got the viscous drag, which is effectively the stickiness of the water rubbing against the hull surface. And we've got wave making resistance, the, the wash or the wake that we see out in the back of the vessel as it sails along. If we look at air resistance to start with, 
Uh, to be honest, there's not a huge amount we can do about that because we have got an enormous great rig stood on top of our vessel creating aerodynamic lift. So we can refine little bits of, of the vessel for that, but it's not really something we can extract a huge amount of, of, of performance or control over. But viscous resistance is. Now, in the scheme of things, water is actually fairly viscous. It's pretty, pretty sticky stuff. And if we look at it at a microscopic scale, as our vessel is sailing along the water, we get a layer of water just on the very surface of our vessel that effectively is sticky enough that it attaches itself to the vessel. Now, this is perhaps a little bit easier to think of if we think of a stationary surface on water flowing over. So what we've got on this, this screen here is uh, a black stationary surface and those blue circles represent water molecules. And what we see happens is that along the surface, the molecules closest to the surface are effectively stuck to the surface and move very slowly. The next layer of molecules above that are able to shear over them and therefore move slightly faster. The next layer above that are able to shear over those and move a little bit faster and so on and so on and so on. So the presence of our surface on the, the water flow itself slows down the water flow or attaches and sticks to the water flow on the, the surface of the vessel. If we look at that as a, a series of vectors to show our velocity, what we therefore see, and again assuming that that vessel is stationary and the water is flowing past, is that the water on the surface of the, sur the vessel flows slowly and gets faster and faster progressively. We get a distribution that looks a little bit like this away from the surface of the vessel. It's what we refer to as a boundary layer. Uh, aircraft have boundary layers, it's a phenomenon of, of fluid dynamics. Uh, our boundary layers in water are, are a little bit different in terms of the thickness and the turbulence perhaps to air, uh, but nonetheless a, a very, very similar mechanism. If we now look at a flat plate and we'll move our flat plate through the water so it's effectively having fluid running um, and flowing over it, we see that these boundary layers start off at the leading edge or the front of our surface and grow and get thicker and thicker as we go downstream. We, we annotate the thickness of the boundary layer as the, the Greek symbol delta. Now, although our boundary layer itself is really very thin, it's perhaps in the order of, of, of millimetres or fractions of a millimetre, it does nonetheless contain an awful lot of water within it. That water is typically acting in a very turbulent way, so the water is jumping between the different layers and creating eddies and all sorts of turbulence, which requires a lot of energy. And it's only got one source of energy, and that's the drive of our vessel. So our, our friction, as it were, the skin friction, as we refer to it, of the vessel moving through the water, creates a substantial amount of drag. This is a little bit heightened or a little bit, or maybe a bit more complex by the pressure changes as our vessel moves through the water. Now, as our, our ship or our object or our yacht moves through the water, the flow comes in and hits the front of it. And that's on this diagram here, the flow is going from left to right. So it flows across, it hits the front of our object where we can see the red area, it's referred to as a stagnation point. And then our flow splits and goes around each side of the object. As it goes around the side of the object, it accelerates a little bit, goes faster and faster, and that changes the pressure around our object. So we get high pressure at the front of the object, a little bit of high pressure towards the back of the object, and low pressure on each side of the object. That change of pressure acts on our boundary layer that we just created to distort it even further. Now, if I take my uh, typical oval objects that we've got here, if I looked at the boundary layer as if it was just developing over a flat plate, I have a profile and a distribution along the bottom of the shape. But in reality, the pressure changes give me a boundary layer distribution that acts over the top of the shape. And these graphs here show the local velocity across the thickness of the boundary layer, across our distance delta, for each of these different points along the boundary layer. When we get to the, the back of the boundary layer, we can see that actually our graph of velocity crosses the, the distorted vertical axis. We are effectively have what we call entrained flow, We've got lots of turbulence, we're creating a huge amount of drag, and what is effectively a, a stickiness of fluid and stickiness of water exaggerates our, our drag and really starts to slow the vessel down. So to be able to go fast, what we need to be able to do is to reduce this viscous resistance. We have to find a way of, of chopping it down. Um, got to have some formally in a scientific talk, and even if you don't like maths, hopefully the, the logic here is, is easy to follow. Our viscous resistance from a, a numerical basis is made up of these components. So it's made up of the water density. The denser the water, the greater the resistance. Well, we can't really do much about water density. We can go and sail 
at the North Pole where it's colder and there's different density and salinity or maybe in fresh water, uh, but we have to, to race where we're told to race. It's directly proportional, sorry, it's, it's, it's proportional to the velocity squared. So the faster we go, the greater the viscous resistance. It's proportional to what's called the friction coefficient, which itself depends on the density of water, the length of our vessel, its speed and the viscosity of the water. It's proportional to what we call the form factor, which is a measure of the shape of the object. But the key is it's also proportional to the wetted surface area. It's directly proportional to the wetted surface area is every bit of wetted surface we put underwater has water molecules rubbing against it. So if we can find a way of reducing the wetted surface area, all of a sudden we can reduce the viscous resistance and we can, in theory, go faster. The only way we can reduce our wetted surface area is to lift the vessel up out of the water. Uh, so what I've got here is, is a graph that I've calculated for a 15 metre long catamaran. This is typical of the, the last America's Cup in terms of the numbers. Along the horizontal axis, it shows us the depth of the water, um, the depth of the hull underwater. And this is assuming we've got no hydrofoils at all. Uh, on the vertical axis, it's got the wettest surface area. Uh, at maximum load, these vessels had a draft of around about 0.4 metres. So the bottom of the hull was about 40 centimetres underwater. And they had a wettest surface area of about 30 metres squared. If I can find a way of lifting the vessel and just keeping the draft or just halving the draft, so half the vessel is still in the water, I'm immediately dropping my wetted surface area down to 15 square meters, and therefore I'm halving my viscous, uh, viscous resistance. So clearly hydrofoils and using a hydrofoil to lift the vessel up out of the water, even a small amount, has quite a large benefit. So air resistance we can't do much about, viscous resistance we can control by trying to lift the vessel out of the water a bit, and then we have wave making resistance. Now wave making resistance is, is the complex one of the three in terms of its mathematical analysis. I'm sure we've all, all been on a ferry or been on a vessel and we've seen the wake out in the back of the, the vessel and around the vessel um, and we can see from the, the picture here the wake forms for a, a vessel a very distinctive wave pattern. It's referred to as a Kelvin wave pattern, oh, sorry after Lord Kelvin, and it comprises of two sets of waves and we can see one of those quite clearly in this picture. That's referred to as the divergent wave system. Uh, the divergent wave system are the, or sorry, the diagonal waves that are coming off the bow and coming off the stern here. What we can't see quite as clearly, though we can in the, the back of the carrier very slightly, is what's called the transverse wave system. And those are waves which run effectively behind the vessel, following the vessel. If I show you this diagram, it might be a, a little bit clearer. Our blue lines here represent the crest of the divergent wave system and the red lines represent the peak of the transverse wave system. And what we typically get for a vessel is one wave system off the bow, as the water is pushed around the bow and accelerates, and one wave system at the stern, as the water moves around the stern and meets itself again. Now, these waves are traveling with the vessel. They travel at the same speed of the vessel. And as we know from classic wave theory, the length of a wave is related to its speed. So as our vessel gets faster and faster and faster, the wavelength, or the distance between these red crests, gets longer and longer and longer. And we get a series of effects around the stern where we get either superposition, the two wave peaks on top of each other, or cancellation, where we get a wave peak on top of a wave trough. Now, the resistance from the waves is directly proportional, or not directly proportional, but proportional to, to this, this interference effect. Uh, basically, our vessel is pushing water out of the way, it's disturbing the water, it's creating pressure changes which we see as these waves. And again, the only way, that, or the only place that energy can come from for these is from the rig and from the driving force of the vessel. So if we want to reduce our wave making resistance, we need to reduce the effects of these waves. Now, to put it into to context, here's a graph that typically shows the wave making resistance calculated for a non-hydrofoil condition for for a typical America's Cup size catamaran. And we can see there's, there's a little bit of a blip at the bottom where we get some funny interference effects, but actually a relatively smooth curve. Um, but the resistance does increase quite quickly the speed. So if I'm doing four meters per second or eight knots, I'm generating about 500 newtons of resistance. If I double that to eight meters per second or 16 knots, straight away I'm creating two and a half thousand newtons of resistance. And if I quadruple it up to 16 meters per second, I'll be creating probably up here about seven and a half thousand newtons of resistance. So again, if we want to go faster and faster and we want to control the resistance, 
we need to be able to control this wave making resistance. Unfortunately, we can control wave making resistance in just the same way that we can control our viscous resistance. Again, if we look at the, the mathematics of it and the components that make up our wave making resistance, again, it's water density that we can't really do much about. It's velocity, which we want to be as big as possible. It also comes down to the wetted surface area. So again, if I can halve the wetted surface area, I can halve the wave making resistance. But it also comes down to a factor called CW, our wave making resistance coefficient. Now, mathematically, this is actually really difficult to deal with. And it's, it's one of the last great mathematical challenges really of being able to, to calculate something directly or have an accurate formula for something directly. Uh, what I can tell you without worrying too much about the, the nasty maths of it is that this wave making coefficient CW is proportional to the underwater volume. So if I lift the vessel up out of the water slightly and I have less of the vessel in the water, CW drops down very quickly and the wave making resistance drops. So all the logic says that actually lifting the vessel up out of the water is going to help. And here, again, a graph just showing this underwater volume against the draft of the vessel for our, our typical American's Cup catamaran. So a normal draft, fully loaded, around about 40 centimetres, got about four and a half metres cubed of underwater volume. Even if I lift the vessel up halfway out of the water, that drops down to about 1.4 metres cubed. So a big saving very quickly. So air resistance, as I said, can't really do much about. Viscous resistance, we can reduce by lifting the vessel up out of the water and very happily wave making resistance we can reduce by lifting the vessel up out of the water. So you see logic suggests that lifting the vessel up out of the water is the, the way to go. And if we actually have a look at the, the combined effects of this, we get a graph that starts off looking a bit like this. Now, these are the different components, our viscous drag, our wave making drag and the total drag, um, ignoring the aerodynamic drag as we increase speeds on our vessel. And this is, is calculated using a a fluid dynamics process. If I start to fit hydrofoils to our vessel and we start accelerating through the same speed range again, we get this variation. Oops. Sorry, bear with me. There we are, sorry. Got a couple of extra slides I thought I deleted there. So as we start to accelerate, our viscous resistance we initially see increases. Our viscous resistance increases because actually we've increased the wetted surface area by adding hydrofoils to our vessel. But as we go faster and faster and faster, our hydrofoils create more and more lift. They start to lift the vessel up out of the water. The wetted surface area reduces. And all of a sudden we see that our viscous resistance starts to drop down and then pretty much levels with a, a very gentle gradient upwards. So a little bit of a penalty at low speeds, but nonetheless at higher speeds, we drop the viscous resistance rapidly. If we look at the wave making drag, as we start to accelerate our vessel going faster and faster and faster, it doesn't really, or the, the addition of hydrofoils doesn't really have any impact on the wave making at low speeds because they're, they're well away from the surface and they don't really impact on it. But as we start to lift the vessel, we get less of the vessel underwater. So the wetted surface area goes down, CW goes down, and therefore the wave making resistance goes down. And if we add them up together, we get a graph that looks a bit like this. So at low speeds, our hydrofoils actually give us a drag penalty and they slow the vessel down. At higher speeds, once we reach a certain sweet spot, we reduce the drag and we go faster and faster and faster. And in fact, in theory, and we'll, we'll look at this more in a moment, the faster we go, the more lift we create, the further we lift the vessel out of the water, therefore the less the drag is, therefore the faster we can go. Um, but there's obviously a, a finite limit, which we'll, we'll see. So that's how hydrofoils act to, to reduce the drag. That's how it allows us to go really quickly by this, this double effect of reducing the two key components. But I think it's interesting just to look at, at how a foil works or an aerofoil or a hydrofoil works in the first place. There's a, a theory for, for fluids that um, aerodynamicists and hydrodynamicists sometimes refer to as the intelligent fluid theory. Uh, and this is the one that's taught in schools. And it tells us that an aerofoil or a hydrofoil has a bit of a curved shape. And our fluid flow here with the, the blue arrows comes in and meets the leading edge of our aerofoil or the leading edge of our hydrofoil. And it splits. Some of it goes over the top, some of it goes over the bottom. And the, the, the GCSE textbooks tell us that along the top of the foil, we've got a longer path because of the curvature. Therefore, the fluid has to go faster to go around the longer path. 
therefore the pressure drops. And Bernoulli's law tells us that the faster a fluid goes, the greater the pressure drops. Conversely, along the bottom of the coil, it tells us that it's a shorter path because of the curvature, so our fluid has to go slower, and therefore we get a higher pressure. Now, the problem with, with the intelligent fluid theory really is this, there's two issues with it. First of all is it doesn't tell us how aircraft fly upside down, and empirically that's been proven that they can, uh, but it also makes the assumption that the water wants to rejoin at the same place. So the molecules going over the top and the molecules going over the bottom want to join up again at the back of the foil. Now, there's a, a huge amount of research into fluids and fluid dynamics, and as yet, none of it has proven that water molecules make for life. There's absolutely no reason that the molecules going over the top of the foil want to meet the bottom. So actually, this doesn't explain how a hydrofoil works in reality. <clears throat> To see how it actually works and to see how a hydrofoil or an aerofoil works, we need first of all just to, to step back and make a couple of simple assumptions. So let's assume instead of having an aerofoil or a hydrofoil, we have a flat plate. And actually at slow speeds, flat plates make it exceptionally efficient lifting devices. So again, our, our fluid flow is going to come in from the left hand side uh, over towards the right hand side and our flow is going to hit our hydrofoil. So I say our assumption is here that particular assumption there's no viscosity in our fluid and we'll, we'll see the effect of this in a moment. Again the higher the flow speed the lower the pressure and it's the difference in pressure between the top and the bottom that create our, our lift. So what I can do around this flat foil or this flat plate is I can calculate what we call flow streamlines. Flow streamlines if you like are, are like the isobars on a weather map they're showing lines of equal volume of flow between them. And if I plot them, they look a bit like this. And there's one particular one in the middle, which gets interesting, uh, coloured here in red, where our flow is coming in, the flow reaches our flat panel, and it's got to decide whether it goes above it or below it. So there's a natural point where our flow splits and goes one side or towards the other. And we refer to that as the stagnation point. We get one of those at the leading edge, one of those at the trailing edge, as we can see, the nature of the fluid, particularly when there's no viscosity, means that these are a little bit offset in the very front and the very back of our flat plate. There's an interesting issue with this as well. If we look at the, the symmetry, there is effectively a vertical symmetry and a horizontal symmetry. And that tells us that actually in terms of forces, our flat plate here with no viscosity wouldn't actually create any lift at all. It's referred to as the, the D'Alembert paradox. But if we look at our stagnation stream in a little bit more detail and we start to add in the effects of viscosity or stickiness within the fluid, we start to see quite a different pattern. And this is how we, we actually get lift to be generated. So adding in some viscosity and, and concentrating on the training edge, the, the rear of our foil, the back of it, what we see is the flow, the flow comes around, tries to flow right around the corner of our foil and then back off downstream again. Now, Fluid doesn't like going around corners, it really doesn't. It doesn't effectively have enough energy to be able to stick together, go around the corner and back again. So what it does instead is it basically unloads that energy and it creates what we call a starting vortex. So instead of being able to flow around the back, it says, I can't do it, too difficult, and just sits there spinning around and around and around. That starting vortex is very small, but is incredibly powerful. And what it does is it breaks away from the back of our foil and it acts like a tiny but incredibly powerful cog. And that tiny but incredibly powerful cog, rotating as we see it here in an anti-clockwise direction, pulls the flow behind it and causes it to create something called circulation to rotate in a clockwise direction. And that circulation effectively changes the shape of the flow around the back of the foil, not so much the front, but around the back, and pulls the stagnation streamline and locks it to the back of our shape, the back of our foil. And that's what actually creates our difference in forces, which then, or sorry, our difference in pressures, which then creates a lift force upwards, but also a drag force backwards. So the, the effect of creating lift from our hydrofoil is, is a lot more complex than just the flow changing. Um, but actually it's one of those, those lovely bits of physics, lovely bits of science that you can see for yourself and you can see in practice. If you run a bath of, of water and you just sprinkle a light dusting of flour over the top of it, uh, not too much obviously, otherwise you'll just create a bath full of glue. But then take a credit card, lower your credit card into the water, so it's half in, half out, 
twist it at a very slight angle, just five or 10 degrees, and then just move it exactly as this flat plate hits it here and pull it up out the water very quickly. And you should be able to see the flower rotating a little starting vortex and ahead of it, you'll see a much bigger circulation with the surface of the water going round and round and round. So a great experiment that you can, can do at home with the kids. So our, our foil, our hydrofoil creates our lift and creates our drag. And again, this is exactly how an aircraft wing works, how it, it works in practice. But if we have a look at uh, an aircraft wing compared to a hydrofoil, we do see that there are quite a few differences. Now, this diagram here shows a cross section of a typical aircraft wing. It's called a NACA foil on the top. Um, and then below that is a typical cross section of a hydrofoil. Uh, a particular type of hydrofoil referred to as an Epler 817 or E817 foil. And if we look at the shape of these two foils, we can see that although they're, they're doing the same principal job in creating lift, they're actually very different shapes. Um, reason being is that our hydrofoil were only ever really interested in creating lift upwards. Uh, if the vessel's upside down, we're not particularly interested in sailing it fast, we need to do other things. So we only, only worried about lift in one direction. But what it also does is it helps to distribute the pressure more evenly. Now, what we see typically with a hydro or with a, a normal aerofoil is that the low pressure is concentrated around the front of the foil there when it operates at a slight angle of attack. And you get a big suction area here that's doing most of the lift. By taking the shape of our hydrofoil here, we actually concentrate that suction. So it's a pulling drawing with the mouse. We concentrate that, that low pressure and that suction force, if you like, over a much greater area of the foil. And as we'll see in a moment, there's a, a logic for us doing that. So our sections for our hydrofoils are a little bit different, perhaps, for an aircraft foil. And then we need to look at what we call the plan form. Here's a, a photo of, of one of the hydrofoils of our solar whisper to explain that. The plan form is effectively the length of our foil referred to as the span and the cord of the foil, the four and a half distance. And those two together create what we call the aspect ratio. Now, very similar idea again to aircraft or to, to birds or an aerodynamic device. A foil with a high aspect ratio has got a very long wing, as we can see here. A foil with a low aspect ratio has got a very short wing. Typically, in nature, we see high aspect ratios working at low speed. So this is your eagle soaring and a low aspect ratio at higher speeds, so your peregrine falcon diving. The reason we see different aspect ratios is they principally control two different things on the foil. They control our lift, so how much good useful force we're getting picking the foil up and lifting our vessel up, and they also control the drag. Now, effectively, if we go for a vessel or a foil with a really high, really large aspect ratio, as we've got here on the right, our green line in the graph, which shows the lift, is really high, and the red line, which shows the drag, is really low. So that's good news. On the left-hand side, if I've got a very short stumpy foil, then I've got lots and lots of drag and not an awful lot of lift. Now, your peregrine falcon diving at, uh, at over 100 miles an hour is not particularly worried about creating drag because he's got all of his energy and, and, and potential energy and gravity to help him, whereas our eagle that wants to soar for a long time needs lots of lift because he's big and he's going quite slowly and doesn't want too much drag. So from our point of view, we're sort of mimicking that with hydrofoils. We want a hydrofoil with a nice big aspect ratio. So that's gonna give us lots of lift in the minimum drag. The difficulty with that is as our aspect ratio goes up, we start to get a longer and thinner foil proportionally. It's creating very large pressure changes, very large amounts of lift, and it becomes quite difficult structurally to be able to build it so it simply doesn't vibrate or oscillate, or even in the worst case, just snap off. Um, some of the forces involved are, are absolutely immense. Whereas our low aspect ratio, our short stumpy foil, has got a lot less lift. It's got smaller pressure changes for its low pressure area. It's got lighter deflections, but it just doesn't do the same job lifting the vessel up out of the water. So from a design point of view, we really have to find a sweet spot between the two of these, making sure we've got a sensible plan form, a sensible aspect ratio, creating just enough lift that we want, but really only just enough because we don't want to be, be going into to structural issues. And the other thing that complicates this is this issue here with high lift and large pressure changes. And this is a, this is a problem that the, the aerodynamicists and aircraft designers 
don't have to worry about so much, but it does, does create a problem for hydrophores for us. Because it's a particular phenomenon known as cavitation. Um, we're all familiar, hopefully, with the idea that a substance can exist in three phases. It's, it's solid phase, it's liquid phase, and it's gaseous phase. And if we take water as an example, in its solid phase, it's ice, its liquid phase is water, and its gaseous phase is, is water vapor or, or steam, if you like. And we're used to the idea that actually we go from ice to water at zero degrees and from water to water vapor when it boils at 100 degrees, a crude measure. Um, but in fact, the transition between the two different or the different phases depends on pressure as well as temperature. So, for example, if I took a kettle to the top of Mount Everest, we'd find that the boiling point where it transitions from water to water vapor is around about 70 degrees. So you're never going to get a good cup of tea on the top of Mount Everest. From our point of view, though, as designing foils, this starts to create a problem for us. Um, hopefully you'll be able to see this video and this will, will make a bit of, of sense. This is um, in my laboratory at work. Uh, what I've got here is a bottle. It's actually an Afia gin bottle. We had to go through a lot of gin before we found the optimum bottle for this experiment. It's linked up to a vacuum chamber. So what I'm gonna do here is I've got just ordinary tap water straight out of the tap, linked up to the vacuum chamber, and I'm gonna switch the vacuum on and I'm going to lower the pressure within the bottle. And what you'll see as the pressure drops down is effectively the liquid boils. And this is the phenomenon known as cavitation. So you can see the pressure or the vacuum then building pressure drops and there we are. It's quite violent, isn't it? If I show you here on this video on the right, this is showing it in close up and you can see that it's, it's very definitely not boiling from the bottom. It's not a, a heat thing. It's nucleating effectively these, these air bubbles or these, these vapour are nucleating and starting where they can attach themselves to little bits of, of dirt and debris in the water. And so you see this in, in slow motion. So why is, is this a problem? Well, unfortunately for us, the low pressure surface on top of our hydrofoil when it's creating lift actually drops to a low enough pressure that we can create cavitation. And that does, does two things effectively. First of all, it increases the drag massively. Um, it reduces the lift as well at the same time because our, our hydrofoil all of a sudden is basically running in air instead of water. Uh, but it's actually violent enough that it can cause damage to our hydrofoil. It can take lumps out of it. Um, so we need to be very careful with, with cavitation. There's a little side effect as well associated with it called ventilation, where again, we can drop the pressure on top of the foil and it gets so low that it sucks in air from above and we effectively get cavitation through that mechanism. But either way, we, we basically get to a point where we're going so fast with our hydrofoil that we cavitate and we start to destroy the lift that we're creating. And really that's why if we go back to this graph that we saw at the start, that we get this distribution where there's, if you like, a bit of a, a wall at 70 miles an hour, because at that point, the faster we go and the more energy we're putting in, effectively just creates more cavitation, which damages our hydrofoils, but also loses a slip. So we're sinking back down in the water as fast as we're trying to lift up our water again. So we have this, this sort of theoretical, slight, slightly variable, but a theoretical upper limit that we need to be a bit careful of. So as we're sailing along, as I said, we, we're going faster and faster and faster, and we create more and more lift, and we start to lift our vessel out of the water. We're reducing the viscous resistance, we're reducing the wave making drags, so we're reducing the total drag. And, and improving our performance all the time. But as our vessel lifts up out of the water, we start to find that there's less and less. And in theory, our vessel will carry on lifting up out of the water until it lifts completely up out of the water and levitates. Now, obviously we know we've, we've got gravity acting, so levitation is not really possible. Um, so if we're not careful, what happens is our vessel lifts up out of the water, the foils get too close to the surface. The closer they are to the surface, the more likely they are to cavitate because they've effectively got less water pressure pushing on top of them. And therefore we get cavitation and our vessel drops down again. And then we accelerate and we get cavitation and it drops down again. And you get this oscillating issue, which again is, is with the Whitehawk hydrofoil is probably what caused them these, these nosedives and these particular problems. So to get around that, traditionally, we would use a ladder system. And we can see on, on Alexander Graham Bell's vessel here, the hydrofoils are actually made up of a whole series of ladders. And the idea being this, that our foil looks like this. And as you go faster and faster, the vessel lifts up out of the water. 
you have fewer and fewer of the lifting coils in the water, therefore you're creating less lift. And actually you get to a nice equilibrium point where the lift of the foil is pushing up, is the same as the mass of the vessel pushing down, and you sit and you ride at a constant height, which is a, a really good, really elegant solution to, to the problem, and a good way of, of controlling the amount of lift and having some sort of control system. Uh, but it does create a lot of drag at those speeds, and it makes it even harder to, to take off in the first place. So with modern hydrofoils, what we try and do is actually steal some ideas from, from the aviation world. So we tend to design foils where we can, with a little flap on the trailing edge that we can control. Reason being is if we're too deep in the water and we've got too much of the vessel underwater, we create too much drag. So we want to lift our vessel up again. So we can drop the flap down and we can lift. If we're at the perfect ride height, we can keep the flap level and we can, can balance out the lift. And if we're too high riding as we go along and our hydrofoil is too close to the surface and at risk of cavitation, we can lift the foil up and we can create we can effectively dump the lift, we can drop the vessel down a bit, and we can ride at the height we want to. Um, with Solent Whisper and with, with Moths and a couple of other hydrofoils, the easiest way to do this is actually with what we call a wand. We build a very simple mechanism into the foil where we have a wand with a little buoyant float on the end. And as we're going along, that little buoyant float taps along the water surface. It's linked to a mechanism in here which goes down through the foil board into the hydrofoil itself and lifts the flap up and down and allows us to control the ride height. And if we look at this, this fantastic picture of Ron here, the designer sailing the, the solar whisper, we can actually see just there, one of the wands and there, another one of the wands, just completely mechanically controlling the ride height. Uh, Ron, very clever mechanical engineer, very, very, very good at what he did. Uh, but simply just purely through a series of gears and a wand bouncing on the water surface linked to the flap at the trailing edge of the foil, just like an aircraft, he can control the ride height and he can actually change the gears and basically dial in the ride height he wants for the conditions uh, that he's sailing in. So we can get around this, this issue of lift. We can design our vessel so it lifts at the right point and we stop the lift at the right point and we hopefully have equilibrium to be able to go as fast as possible with the foils just deep enough underwater that we're not getting habitation. And again, if we go a little bit faster, we may need to just adjust that a little bit. So we drop the foils a little bit further underwater, which reduces the risk of cavitation, but nonetheless increases the wet surface a little bit again and pushes the drag up. So there is a real balancing act to be had to, to get those together. So designing hydrofoils is, is very much a case of, of a bit of trial and error and a bit of testing. Um, and in fact, when, when Ron built Solar Whisper, um, one of the tests that, that we did with it was to take the vessel out with just the hydrofoils on no rig or anything like that um, with a, a powerboat or rib and um, we towed basically towed the hydrofoil up and down Southampton water going a little bit faster every time until it started to lift and then Ron was very brave uh, basically learned to, to fly it being towed along by a powerboat so um, we got some funny looks from the Isle of Wight ferry so in terms of testing hydrofoils we can do do these tests um, we don't really have the, the luxury for hydrofoils of too much in the way of experimental work. Uh, obviously, if we're designing an aircraft wing, we can use a wind tunnel. Um, for a wind tunnel to be able to move water at the same velocities as needed for a, a wind tunnel will require immense amounts of energy. So we have something similar, which is called towing tanks, and we've got one. This is a, a photo of our tank at, at the Soviet University campus, where we tow a model through the water and we measure the, the speed, we measure the drag, and we can start to calculate some values. But actually for hydrofoils, for the testing of them, we need to go really quickly. And we need to go actually because of scale effects, far faster than our tank will allow us. So again, there's, there's quite a lot of trial and error that um, we don't really know what we're doing until we, we built it and tested it, which is quite an expensive way of, of learning. Um, so what we actually find, and particularly the America's Cup teams who have you know, huge budgets, but not, uh, not unlimited budgets, is that they have amazing vessels. And here is this great picture of the Britannia, the, the current INEOS or Team INEOS UK vessel, sailing along very nicely. But to test the technology and to make sure that their maths is correct and they can extrapolate up, they literally build small scale test prototypes and they take them out and sail them. Um, to be honest, by the time you've, you've built a whole series of tank testing models and you've built a tank that's, that's fast enough for what you want to do, uh, you might as well just go and build yourself a, a little scale model ship that you can sail around. And um, to be honest, it's probably far more fun. Um, so testing hydrofoils is, is really difficult. So our whole process of, 
of designing a foil and uh, applying a hydrofoil is that we have to, in the first place, make sure we've got the right foil section. And our, our extra section that we saw distributes the low pressure nicely over the top of it, reduces the risk of cavitation. We have to make sure that we've got an appropriate plan form. So we're getting enough lift and not too much drag, but also balancing out the structure within the foil to make sure it's acceptable. We have to make sure that we've aligned all the forces so we're getting enough lift in the first place to be able to go fast enough and that we're not just adding in extra wet surface area. We have to be sure it's actually going to work and we have to test it. Uh, we can do some testing theoretically with, with computational fluid dynamics, but again, much more fun to build something and, and sail it. Um, and then ultimately, and that's something we really don't have time to go through in this presentation, we need to make sure it is structurally strong enough. So we need to look at advanced composites and various manufacturing techniques to make sure that it's actually going to stay in one piece. Now, unfortunately, the, the very first sail at Whisper, the power, the, the, the prototype um, was sold to somebody who took it sailing in Norway and sailed into a rock at about 35 knots. Um, so imagine the structure didn't, uh, didn't survive that too long. So hopefully that gives you a, a, a very quick run through of, of some of the, the science between hydrofoils and, and the, the, the science of sailing really, really very quickly. I'm very happy to, to take any questions.